Hello everybody, this is Dr. Nadeem. We are with Neelam Path Lectures, the Pursue series. As you are aware, all our lectures are available on YouTube. We also have a Telegram group which is helpful in accessing all lecture related information. We have a Google Drive where the PDF of all the lectures are available. It is freely downloadable. These are the disclaimers. We are in phase 3 which is recorded pathology lectures and today we have Pursue 21H which is Immune Disorders Session 4 and we are streaming from Ames Bhubaneswar. And today's topic is Autoimmune Disorders Part 2 and to talk on that we have Dr. Amit Kumar Adhya who is an MD from PGI Chandigarh, a professor in the Department of Pathology and Lab Medicine Ames Bhubaneswar. He is also an ex-professor of Kalinga Institute of Medical Science Bhubaneswar with 118 publications in national and international journals, one book chapter, six funded projects, 21 years of teaching and research experience. He has completed five collaborative research projects funded by DBT and BRNS. Awarded the best paper award at the IAPM 2005. With this, I would request Dr. Amit Kumar Adhya to start his lecture on autoimmune disorders, session two. Over to you, Dr. Adhya. Thank you. Hello, students. Welcome to the fourth lecture on immune disorders. Here, I shall talk about some of the autoimmune disorders. I shall first talk about Jogren syndrome. Although systemic lupus erythematosus and rheumatoid arthritis are very common, Jogren syndrome also occurs frequently. It's an immune mediated destruction of the lacrimal and the salivary glands. The lacrimal glands you know is present within the orbit and produces tears. The tears which help in lubrication of the conjunctiva of the eyeball. So destruction of the lacrimal gland leads to decrease in tear production that manifests as dry eyes which is known as keratoconjunctivitis sicca. Destruction of the salivary gland leads to dryness within the mouth which is known as gerostomia. A primary and a secondary form of this disorder are known. The primary form is known as sicca syndrome and the secondary form is usually associated with other autoimmune disorders such as systemic lupus erythematosus and mixed connective tissue disorders. The pathogenesis of this disease, we have already discussed the general pathogenesis of autoimmune disorders previously where I have said that genetic susceptibility and environmental exposure both are necessary for production of an autoimmune disorder. Here also the same logic applies. In a genetically susceptible individual, environmental exposure leads to destruction of the salivary glands and destruction of salivary gland leads to exposure, exposure of hidden antigen to the immune system. The immune system particularly the CD4 positive T cells, they recognize these hidden antigens and mount an immune response against the salivary gland tissue. You will find anti-nuclear antibodies in 50 to 80 percent of these patients. These patients also show antibodies characteristically the SSA and SSB antigen antibodies known as the Rho and La antibody in 90 percent of these patients. Although these antibodies are not specific but they are very characteristic of Jogren syndrome these antibodies can also be found in systemic lupus erythematosus. Genetic susceptibility as I spoke about is basically when the patients have typical type of HLA such as HLA B8, TR3, W58, DQA1 and DQB1 loci. These patients are very susceptible or has a higher risk of developing Jogren syndrome. As I said, this is a disease which involves the salivary gland. The minor salivary gland of the oral mucosa are the most common ones which are involved in this disease. Hence, the diagnosis of this disease requires a biopsy of the minor salivary gland which is usually taken from the lip. Lower lip is the preferred site from where a biopsy is taken to look for destruction and damage of the minor salivary gland. 
as you can see in the pictures the left hand side picture shows a normal salivary gland where there is there are sni there are duct and there is no inflammation whereas the right side panel shows a full blown picture of systemic sclerosis sorry jogren syndrome which shows presence of a lot of lymphocytic infiltration there is complete absence of normal sni because the sni are all damaged due to inflammation and small ducts are prominent some of these patients they due to this extensive inflammatory infiltrate by lymphoid cells can later on develop lymphomas of the lymphomas as you know are malignant tumors of lymphocytes or lymphoid cells and typically this patient develop a lymphoma which is known as a maltoma malt stands for mucosa associated lymphoid tissue and maltoma refers to a lymphoma arising from the malt tissue the symptoms and signs in jogren syndrome you will find mostly are confined to the eyes and that oral cavity in the patients will have a dry eye dryness in the eye will lead to constant irritation by the eyelids that will lead to ulceration inflammation and due to inflammation the eyes will become red painful and swollen the mouth will become dry there will be cracks and fissures will appear in the tongue so there will be difficulty in eating food and deglutition of the food there can be inflammation of the oral cavity leading to redness pain and ulceration apart from these things the patient can also develop swelling of all the three major salivary glands and they will appear as a enlarged salivary gland within the neck region sometimes all the salivary gland the uh, such as the parotid the submandibular and the sublingual all the salivary glands are massively enlarged such a condition is known as a mucolage syndrome so mucolage syndrome is basically a condition where the salivary glands are enlarged but mucolage syndrome is not confined to jogren syndrome as mucolage syndrome can also be seen in other situations such as sarcoidosis lymphomas and other conditions of the salivary gland another common autoimmune disorder is known as systemic sclerosis also known as scleroderma sclerosis means hardening this hardening is basically due to fibrosis and mostly the skin is affected so the skin becomes very hard hence the term scleroderma in this disease there is extensive fibrosis throughout the body most commonly skin gi tract kidney heart muscle and lungs are involved the disease can be diffuse when it is known as a diffuse scleroderma diffuse means widespread involvement of skin and other viscera are present or it can be limited that is only skin or some areas of the uh, fingers and face are affected that is known as limited form of scleroderma very very commonly this is associated with a syndrome known as the crest syndrome the crest basically is a mnemonic which stands for calcinosis raynaud's phenomenon esophageal dysfunction sclerodactylity and telangiectasia calcinosis is deposition of calcium within the skin we'll discuss about raynaud's phenomenon later esophageal dis dysfunction basically occurs where there is fibrosis of the esophagus so the lower esophageal sphincter no more is able to close that leads to reflux of acid content of the stomach into the lower end of esophagus leading to heartburn there is decreased motility of the esophagus as well due to fibrosis of its wall syndactyly basically refers to thickening and tightening of the skin on the fingers of the hand so that the hands become deformed that is due to fibrosis in the skin telangiectasia is dilatation of capillaries causing red marks on the surface and skin
so the crest syndrome is associated with systemic sclerosis the etiopathogenesis of systemic sclerosis basically we know that this is an autoimmune disorder so there has to be some genetic susceptibility and there has to be some external environmental stimuli which both of which are essential for development of this autoimmune disorder the both T and B cells are activated which leads to production of a lot of cytokines such as tumor growth factor beta interleukin 13 and platelet derived growth factor the B cells they differentiate into plasma cells and they produce autoantibodies against all the organ system the external stimuli lead to endothelial injury endothelial injury will lead to for thickening of the wall of the blood vessel and inflammation of the blood vessel all these together they lead to tissue injury and ultimately the tissue injury will heal by fibrosis or scar formation so there is a widespread vascular damage mostly small vessels are involved there is intimal proliferation and chronic inflammation and fibrosis around the blood vessels which is known as perivascular fibrosis so due to this fibrosis there is narrowing of the microvasculature and there is chronic ischemia ischemia leads to necrosis and necrosis is replaced by fibrous tissue or scarring if you take a biopsy of the skin then you will see the, what the morphology of the skin looks like the right side figure shows a biopsy of the skin the left one shows normal skin as if you compare with the biopsy of a patient of scleroderma you the dermal collagen is markedly increased so and the epidermis appears to be more atrophic so there is diffuse sclerosis and atrophy of the skin the fingers upper arm shoulder neck and face are mostly involved there is perivascular infiltrate of CD4 positive T cells, swelling and degeneration of the collagen fibers. The damage and destruction is further replaced by fibrosis and calcification. The GI tract is also involved in this disease where you find the esophagus, the lower two thirds show a rubber hose like inflexibility that is due to fibrosis in the wall of the esophagus. So the motility of the esophagus is hampered, the lower esophageal sphincter fails to, uh, fails to close, so there is a gastroesophageal reflux disease, chronic reflux of the gastric content into the lower esophagus leads to what is known as a Barrett metaplasia. If you remember your other general pathology class, you will remember, know that Barrett esophagus is basically a condition where the lower squamous epithelium of the esophagus is replaced by a columnar type of epithelium and this condition can in the long run give rise to adenocarcinoma so it's a dangerous condition to have loss of villi and microvilli in the small bowel which can lead to malabsorption Kidneys are also involved in systemic sclerosis where you find mostly the interlobular arteries are affected. The interlobular arteries are basically arteries having a luminal diameter of 150 to 500 micrometer. The intima of these arteries they get deposited by glycoproteins and mucopolysaccharides and there is concentric intimal proliferation. This gives rise to hypertension in as many as 30% of the patients. In some patients, the hypertension becomes very high when it is known as a malignant hypertension that can lead to death in 50% of the patients. Raynaud's phenomenon can occur independently or can occur as a part of the crest syndrome. As you see in the figure, the Raynaud's phenomenon is basically there are three phases where the distal ends of the finger first become pale due to sudden occlusion or narrowing of the blood vessels. So complete blood flow stops and the fingers become pale. Afterwards partial opening of the blood vessel leads to flow of 
deoxygenated blood or the deoxygenated blood that was already there which had accumulated during the process will show you a blue color of the fingers afterwards the blood vessels will open and blood will rush into the area giving rise to a red color so the transition from a pale to blue to red color due to occlusion and opening of the blood vessels is known as a Reynolds phenomenon. Antibodies are also found in systemic sclerosis. The, typically, you find DNA topoisomerase 1 antibody, which is highly specific for the diagnosis of systemic sclerosis. You also find anticentromere antibody, and this is found in 20 to 30 percent of patients with crest syndromes. These are very typical multiple choice questions, so you need to remember them. Systemic sclerosis patients can have a lot of complications as I have already mentioned in the esophagus loss of the lower esophageal sphincter tone and motility and Barrett esophagus gastroesophageal reflux there can be fibrosis of the lung and pulmonary hypertension the renal crisis that occurs due to anti-multiposition of glycoproteins that is malignant hypertension arising due to narrowing of the blood vessels in the heart there can be fibrosis which is known as cardiac fibrosis bowel can show you obstructions due to irregular fibrosis the contractures in the hand can occur a lot of calcium deposition can occur in and around the joints which is known as calcinosis severe Reynolds phenomenon can sometimes lead to prolonged occlusion of the blood vessel and ischemic necrosis of the distal fingers which is known as gangrene Sometimes the connective tissue disorders will come as a bunch like some patients with SLE will also have system sclerosis and polymyositis so these patients will present with mixed symptoms of SLE and system sclerosis such conditions are known as mixed connective tissue disorders. These patients can have antibodies, anti-nuclear antibodies, antibodies to ribonucleoproteins these patients can have synovitis of the fingers, Raynaud's phenomenon and myositis with kidney involvement. There is another new and newer entity known as the immunoglobulin G4 related disorders. These are diseases that can occur anywhere in the body. Most commonly they can occur in the gallbladder, they can occur in salivary gland, in the pan in and around pancreatic head and lot of other sites can be involved by this IgG4 related disease. What happens here is the tissue is infiltrated by immunoglobulin G4 antibody producing plasma cells and lymphocytes. The lymphocytes are particularly T lymphocytes. You will find in the tissue there is extensive fibrosis. The fibrosis is typically described as a story form pattern of fibrosis. The blood vessels they become obliterated due to fibrosis and this is known as obliterative phlebitis. The serum of this patient will show you high levels of immunoglobulin G4. So these are characteristic feature of this new entity known as immunoglobulin G4 related disorder. As I mentioned the biliary tree, salivary gland, periorbital tissue, kidney, lymph nodes, meninges, aorta, breast, prostate, thyroid and pericardium and skin all can be affected and you can also see the Mikulic syndrome associated with IgG4 related disorder the riddle thyroiditis which is a fibrotic hard thyroid is also a IgG4 related disease another disease known as idiopathic retroperitoneal fibrosis is also now known to be an IgG4 related disorder autoimmune pancreatitis is mostly IgG4 related inflammatory pseudotumors sometimes occur within orbit lungs and kidney and they are also now known to be IgG4 related disorders. So that would be all for this class. Thank you so much.